Well, good evening and welcome to our second service of the day from Buckingham Chapel. The psalmist says, O oh God, you are my God, early will I seek you. My soul thirsts for you, my flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. So I have looked for you in the sanctuary to see your power and your glory. Well, it may not be early, but we can still seek the Lord and should have that same desire to come into his presence and to see his power and glory. So let us express something of that desire as we sing our first hymn. God is in his temple, the almighty Father. Round his footstool, let us gather. Him with adoration serve, the Lord most holy. Let's sing. Let's come to the Lord in prayer. Let's all pray. Our loving Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can come to you this evening, even though you are high and lifted up and surrounded by angels who uh, worship you, who declare that you are the holy, holy, holy God Almighty. Father, we thank you that we come before you because you have clothed us with the righteousness of our Lord Jesus Christ, because of his perfect sacrifice on behalf of his people on the cross. Lord, we pray that each one of us would be uh, aware of our dependence upon you and upon your grace. Lord, that you would keep us and watch over us. Father, we thank you for your mercy. Lord, we confess our sin and ask, Lord, that you would cleanse us Lord, that you would help us to seek after you. Lord, that we would be ever faithful 
uh, Lord, seeking to apply your word to our lives individually and corporately. Father, we thank you that you have revealed so much about yourself through your word. Lord, we thank you that in it we see that you are the sovereign God over all the universe. Lord, that you even spoke the universe into existence. Lord, that you have kept a people for yourself uh, throughout all the ages. And Father, that you have uh, revealed through the scriptures and through your prophets how we can turn to you and know you and have a personal relationship with the living God. Lord, we praise you for this. And Father, we thank you that the day is coming when our Lord Jesus Christ will come again and gather to himself all of his people. And then, Lord, we will be uh, fully transformed, receive our resurrection bodies and be able to worship and adore you for all eternity. Father, in the meantime, Lord, we will commend ourselves to you as individuals and as a church. Lord, we pray that you would keep us, watch over us. Father, we thank you that we've started to be able to uh, gather again for some of our services at the chapel. Lord, we pray that uh, over the coming uh, weeks and months in your mercy, Lord, that uh, all our services might be able to resume. In the meantime, Lord, though, for those unable to come, Lord, we pray that you would watch over them particularly. Lord, may they not uh, feel uh, lonely, but Lord, we do pray that uh, as a people, we would be supporting and helping uh, one another at this time. Father, we would pray too for uh, the, the Sunday school and, and the Roma children and others, Lord, who have not been able to, to join with us. Father, we pray that you would be keeping them. Lord, that you would be reminding them of the uh, things that they've heard in Sunday school. Father, even in their tender years, Lord, we pray that they would be seeking after you. And Father, we pray you give us wisdom as we uh, look to uh, have further contact uh, with them, to bring the word of God to them and to share the gospel with them. Father, we would pray for our nation too at this time. Lord, we pray for the Queen and her government. Lord, we pray that you would uh, give them uh, much wisdom as they seek to continue to deal with this pandemic, to uh, advise on uh, the uh, regulations that we should uh, follow. Lord, the limitations. Father, we pray that these things uh, would be uh, applied and Lord that uh, through it the uh, spread of the virus would be uh, contained and Father that in your mercy and goodness in due time a vaccine might be found. Father we pray that our nation would learn uh, through this time Lord that there would be many who would seek after you as a consequence of seeing their own vulnerability uh, to this thing and Father that when they seek after you Lord that they might indeed find you and be saved. Now our Father we ask that you would be with us through the rest of the evening. Father may all that is done and said be to your praise and honour and glory. We ask it all with the forgiveness of our sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, uh, this evening, we are going to be looking again at Paul's letter to the Colossians, which tells us much about Christ. In it, we read, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. In him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, who is the head of all principality and power. God has made us alive together with him, having forgiven us all trespasses. So let us express our love for Christ as we sing our next hymn. Fairest of all the earth beside, that man of Calvary has won my heart from me and died to set me free. Blessed man of Calvary. Let's sing to his praise. Mm -hmm. 
Let's stand and really sing it with all our hearts. Please turn with me to Colossians chapter 4. Colossians chapter 4. We're going to be reading from uh, verse 2 through to the end of the chapter, verse 18. So Colossians chapter 4, verses 2 to 18. I'll be reading from the New King James Version. Let's hear the word of God. Continue earnestly in prayer being vigilant in it with thanksgiving. Meanwhile, praying also for us, that God would open to us a door for the word, to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I am also in chains, that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. Walk in wisdom toward those who are outside, redeeming the time. Let your speech always be with grace seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer each one. Tychicus, a beloved brother, faithful minister, and fellow servant in the Lord, will tell you all the news about me. I am sending him to you for this very purpose, that he may know your circumstances and comfort your hearts. With Onesimus, a faithful and beloved brother, who is one of you, they will make known to you all things which are happening here. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greets you with Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, about whom you received instructions 
if he comes to you, welcome him. And Jesus, who is called Justice, these are my only fellow workers for the kingdom of God, who are of the circumcision. They have proved to be a comfort to me. Epaphras, who is one of you, a bondservant of Christ, greets you, always labouring fervently for you in prayers, that you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. For I bear him witness that he has a great zeal for you, and those who are in Laodicea, and those in Hierapolis. Luke, the beloved physician, and Demas greet you. Greet the brethren who are in Laodicea, and Nymphas, and the church that is in his house. Now when this epistle is read among you, see that it is read also in the church of the Laodiceans, and that you likewise read the epistle from Laodicea. And say to Archippus, Take heed to the ministry which you have received in the Lord, that you may fulfil it. This salutation by my own hand, Paul. Remember my chains. Grace be with you. Amen. Well, may the Lord add his blessing to the reading and hearing of his inspired and infallible word. Before we consider God's words, let us sing our next hymn, Nearer, Still Nearer, Close to Thy Heart. <laughs> 
turn back with me to uh, Colossians chapter 4. Now we've come to the end of a, a wonderful letter, an inspired revelation from God. It would be easy to pass over these final greetings, exhortations and the closing blessing in verses 7 to 18. However, I trust we will find encouragement and help in this section. From the number and nature of the greetings in this letter and others, uh, particularly Romans, we see something of Paul's heart for other people and the mutual love and respect that must have existed between them. In particular, we learn about the network of early church leaders and their relationship to the church members. And we also learn some things about the functioning of the early church. There were strong bonds of love between them. Hence, my title for this sermon is Fellowship in the Family. The people that Paul mentions as bringing greetings to the Colossians were part of his ministry in Rome. And as Aaron and Hur supported the arms of Moses as they appealed to God for success against the Amalekites, so these men were vital to Paul in his ministry. Hopefully from these insights into the individuals and functioning of the early church, we can also draw out some applications for us as a church. Now we've previously remarked on the fact that Paul had not founded the church at Colossae, nor visited it prior to writing this epistle. But the detail in this section shows us and his readers that he would have been very well acquainted with the church and its needs from those who had first-hand knowledge of the church. Hence we can see that as well as the letter having application to the church universal of every age, it had a very particular relevance to the Colossians and the needs and dangers that they faced. They also needed to be reminded that they did not have to face their problems and challenges alone, but the wider church stood with them in love and prayer. So we will work our way through the text, firstly looking at the greetings in verses 7 through 15, then the closing exhortations and blessing in verses 16 and 18, and finally at some applications to our church. Firstly then, the greetings. Let's read again uh, verses 7 to 9. Tychicus, a beloved brother, faithful minister, and fellow servant in the Lord will tell you all the news about me. I am sending him to you for this very purpose, that he may know your circumstances and comfort your hearts. With Onesimus, a faithful and beloved brother who is one of you, they will make known to you all things which are happening here. Tychicus was carrying this letter to the Colossians from Paul in prison. He had been a trusted member of Paul's missionary team, a native of the uh, Roman province of Asia, which is modern day Turkey. We read of him first in Acts 20, when Paul was ministering in Greece on his third missionary journey. He seems to have remained with Paul until very near the end of Paul's ministry. He is also trusted by Paul to deliver the letters to Colossae, Philemon, and Ephesians, which we have in our New Testament, plus a letter to Laodicea and probably other letters. Now, as well as being an important mission, it would have been an arduous and perilous journey from Rome. He travelled hundreds of miles so that the churches could be blessed by these letters, and the church today can still receive great blessing from them. Notice how he's described by Paul, firstly, as a beloved brother. This was their primary relationship that had grown up over the years. He was also a faithful minister and a fellow servant in the Lord. So he had proved himself to be faithful, reliable and trustworthy. The word for minister here is the same as we translate deacon elsewhere. And Paul uses the same word to describe his own ministry. The word for fellow servant implies that both Paul and Tychicus 
were bondservants or slaves of the same master. The Lord is that master. And uh, this deacon was very much a valued member of the ministry team within the wider church, not just someone undertaking menial tasks. He had the same heart for the gospel as is found in Paul. In fact, later, he is mentioned by Paul as a possible substitute for Titus when Paul asked Titus to come to him at the end of his ministry. As well as bringing this precious letter to the Colossians, Paul entrusts him with the task of telling the Colossians all the news about Paul himself, and thus to encourage the Colossians with that news. Paul is not just some far off church leader, and even though he hasn't met most of the Colossian church, he has a personal connection with them and wants them to know all about him as part of his fellowship with them, and perhaps so that they can pray more specifically on Paul's behalf. Those sorts of personal details were better explained in person than in writing, so that the Colossians would be proper, would properly understand Paul's circumstances and well-being. Accompanying Tychicus is Onesimus. Onesimus is, of course, the runaway slave of whom we read in the brief letter to Philemon where Paul pleads to Philemon on behalf of Onesimus. That is why Paul describes him as one of you. Now, being a slave or lowly bondservant in that society was generally not as demeaning as the awful transatlantic slavery, which is still causing so much strife in our modern society. Yet, in the Roman Empire and Jewish society, being a bondservant or slave still made you a second-class citizen, and runaway slaves could be executed. But in Christ, there was no such class distinction. Onesimus is valued just as much as other believers, and is not described here as a slave. Rather, he is to Paul a faithful and beloved brother. He has shown his faith consistently. He is loved, part of the family of God, and in mentioning him before the whole Colossian church, and not just Philemon, Paul wants them all to see his evaluation of Onesimus. Indeed, there is evidence from one of the early church fathers that Onesimus may have eventually become an elder of the Colossian church. So perhaps Paul saw that potential in this beloved co-laborer. Our Lord told his disciples in John 13, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this all will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. We must ask ourselves, does such love characterise our relationships? Do we regard our fellow believers not as members of the same club, but of the same family? Indeed, the bonds can often be closer than those with non-Christian family, because the same Holy Spirit indwells all true believers, and we have a common love, vision and direction to our lives. Paul is not alone in prison. As we see in verse 10, Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greets you. Aristarchus, likewise, was a close companion of Paul, having ministered with him in Ephesus, and continuing with him to Jerusalem and Rome. He shared imprisonment with Paul, probably voluntarily, so as to assist and comfort Paul. So we see that mission work has always been dangerous, and prison and death remain possibilities even in our day in some territories. Aristarchus applied the words in Matthew 25, verse 36, in supporting Paul. Jesus said, I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. We need in our churches people who will show real sympathy and practical support and help us bear our burdens. Then we have mentioned a more familiar individual with Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, 
you will recall that a rift had existed for a time between Paul and Barnabas because of Mark, who had left them part way through their first missionary journey. Thankfully, these brethren were later reconciled, and we perhaps get a hint of that in that Paul goes on to say about Mark, about whom you received instructions, if he comes to you, welcome him. So clearly, Mark was not written off by Paul, and despite the early setback, he became very useful in the kingdom of God, not least for the gospel that bears his name. So we shouldn't give up on ourselves or others just because of a failure or fear in particular circumstances. Finally, in this section, he mentions, verse 11, Jesus, who is called Justice, about whom we know nothing beyond what we have here. But he too was valued by Paul and immortalised in God's word. The name Justice means righteous. Now, surely you must have been quite a person to live up to the title of Jesus, the righteous. Like him, we don't need to be known by others, but we do need to be faithful servants of the Lord and his people, and to be helpers and encouragers of those engaged in frontline ministry. Paul was not a lone wolf. He valued co laborers So he says, these are my only fellow workers for the kingdom of God who are of the circumcision. They have proved to be a comfort to me. He is clearly feeling an awareness that they are a relatively small team for the task before them. Often we can feel the same and feel almost overwhelmed by our responsibilities, since every labourer in the church is vital to its work. But thankfully, we have a God whose power and ability is limitless. Nevertheless, we should remember our Lord's words when he said, The harvest is plentiful, but the labourers are few. Therefore pray the Lord of the harvest to send out labourers into his harvest. These men of whom Paul was speaking had another thing in common with Paul. They were all of the circumcision, in other words, Jews, his fellow countrymen. Now we know from Paul's pattern of evangelism in Acts, and from Romans 9 to 11 in particular, that whilst Paul was an apostle to the Gentiles, he had a real burden for his fellow Jews, most of whom had rejected the Messiah, and he was probably disappointed that only three Jews were amongst his close associates during his incarceration. He not only had this natural connection with these Jewish believers, believers uh, but he has mentioned that uh, they proved to be a comfort to him. So we can think of Paul as a great apostle, on fire for Christ, but we need to remember that he also had feelings like we do. He said, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain, but he wasn't a superman. These men that he's spoken of had over time and particularly during Paul's imprisonment, proved their friendship by being a comfort to Paul. As Vines put it, they were a soothing solace. We need to be a comfort to each other through our trials, and we mustn't neglect our pastor and his wife in that regard. They too need help, encouragement and friendship. How do we comfort one another? With our words, affection and human contact. By talking about our God, who he is and what he means to us and is doing. Not just with platitudes, but sharing God's word together and reflecting on how he has kept us and reminding ourselves of his precious promises. We need to express our fellow feeling, to weep with those who weep and to share our comfort. As Paul puts it in 2 Corinthians 1, the God of all comfort comforts us in all our tribulation that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. Next, we have mentioned in uh, verse 12, Epaphras, who is uh, also described as one of you. Uh, 
Now we heard of Epaphras in chapter 1 and verse 7, from which it appears he was an elder and quite possibly the founder of the Colossian church. He is the one who had made the arduous journey to Paul and told him about the faith of the Colossians and the dangers that they faced from false teachers. Paul is here showing and endorsing the qualities of Epaphras and perhaps implicitly demonstrating to the Colossians that they should be listening to this minister of the gospel, not the newcomers with their message that the Colossians needed to add to Christ special knowledge, Jewish customs, legalism and asceticism. Epaphras is called here a bondservant of Christ, the same description Paul used of himself and Timothy at the start of this letter. Paul recognises his fellow labourers. He is not someone who elevates himself above others. Rather, he and all true leaders are not lords or popes, but slaves or bondservants, serving the people because they know their master is the Lord Jesus Christ. As well as telling Colossians that Epaphras greets them, he says that Epaphras is always labouring fervently for them in prayers. The word translated here as labouring fervently is the root for our word agonising. He is really wrestling in prayer for them all the time. The same word is used of our Lord in the Garden of Gethsemane. I wonder, do we know, do I know, anything of this labouring and agonising in prayer for others? It is not just the pastor's responsibility to be praying for his people, though a pastor should be characterised by consistent and persistent prayer. As Paul says in verse 13, For I bear him witness that he has a great zeal for you, and those who are in Laodicea and those in Hierapolis. What does he pray for them? Verse 12, that you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. He wants them to stand, not to be carried about with every wind of doctrine that the false teachers might spout. He also wants them to be able to stand against the evil one. As he tells us in Ephesians 6, we need to put on the whole armour of God to be able to stand against the wiles of the devil and having done all to still stand. Or as Epaphras prays for the Colossians, he wants them to stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. Now, shouldn't that be the prayer of every pastor for his people? Not just praying for their physical needs or the conversion of sinners, but for the spiritual maturing of believers and their complete compliance with the will and word of God in and for their lives. False teachers may have offered a completeness and fullness, but Epaphras and Paul knew that completeness and perfection was to be found only in Christ, by grace and the working of the Holy Spirit in our lives, as the word of Christ dwells in and controls our lives. For we know the will of God through the word of God. Then Paul goes on to bring greetings from Luke, the beloved physician, and Demas. Luke, as we know, was the author of the gospel that bears his name and of the book Acts. The latter book being making it clear that uh, Luke was another dear companion of Paul. Demas at this stage was an, another companion and fellow labourer. But sadly, later, as we learn from 2 Timothy 4 and verse 10, Paul would sadly report, Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world. That reminds us that men can run well for a long time, even be used of God in church leadership, and yet fall or quit because continuing seems too tough or demanding, and what the world has to offer becomes too alluring. So we should be praying for persevering and sustaining grace for ourselves and others, and not be tempted to quit because of difficulties or dangers. We need to be aware that we can be tempted by the world, the flesh and the devil. As Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 12, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. Paul then moves on from giving greetings to asking the Colossians, verse 15, to greet the brethren who are in Laodicea 
and nymphus and the church that is in his house. This tells us something about the early church. Colossae, Laodicea and Hierapolis were three cities in the Lycus Valley. Laodicea was the district capital, 10 miles to the west of Colossae, and Hierapolis was 12 miles to the northwest. So it is clear that there were close ties between the churches. Then there is mention of a church meeting in the house belonging to Nymphus or Nympha, depending on which manuscript you follow. Whether the, ho the home of a man or a woman, it reminds us that the early church didn't have large church buildings, but used the homes of believers. So there was generous hospitality, hospitality from uh, those with larger homes. It therefore seems quite likely that in large cities there would have been multiple congregations, but there was an essential unity between the congregations. In our day, there are many, many divisions, even in the evangelical church. And whilst independent government is important, we perhaps miss out on the unity of the body across the city and wider region. So we need to think about how we foster fellowship with our fellow believers whilst guarding biblical distinctives. Well, let's move on then to the closing exhortations. Paul says, verse 16, Now when this epistle is read among you, see that it is read also in the church of the Laodiceans, and that you likewise read the epistle from Laodicea. So Paul wanted the whole congregation to hear and consider the contents of this letter and the message that he brought to them from God. Likewise, it is important that we have the public reading of the scriptures as part of our worship and consider what God has to say to us, not just individually, but also corporately. Paul wanted this letter to be circulated and obviously it has subsequently been recognised as part of the word of God for the whole church. He also wanted them to read the letter that he had sent to Laodicea, which presumably also had things of benefit to the Colossians. But that letter has not survived, maybe. Some argue that it is in fact the letter that we know as Ephesians, which has many similarities to Colossians and a number of manuscripts that survive for Ephesians lack any reference to Ephesus, suggesting it was a circular letter for many cities. Verse 17, And say to Archippus, Take heed to the ministry which you have received in the Lord, that you may fulfil it. Now Archippus is mentioned in Philemon 2 as our fellow soldier. So it would appear that he had leadership and pastoral responsibilities for part of the Colossian church, the part that met in Philemon's house. The description fellow soldier reminds us that we are in a spiritual battle and part of the Lord's army. As such, leaders in particular are to be disciplined and focused, not just pleasing ourselves. Great care, thought and conscientiousness is needed Hence Archippus is encouraged to take heed to the ministry. Given the false teachers in Colossae, Archippus would have needed to be wary of their influence and protect the people from the false teaching. His ministry was not simply what he had chosen for himself or had been given by others, but it had been received in the Lord. So it is a solemn and special duty from God that needs to be fulfilled to the glory of God. Each member of the body of Christ has a specific function, a ministry, which is vital to the health and growth of the whole body and of their local church. Now, we need to consider uh, that ministry as something received by us from the Lord and thus not to be treated casually or set aside for personal preference or convenience, but rather a blessed privilege and duty to be fulfilled for God's glory and the edification of our fellow believers. Otherwise, the whole church will be damaged. Paul concludes, verse 18, this salutation, by my own hand, Paul, remember my chains, grace be with you, 
Amen. Paul generally dictated his letters, but tended to close them in his own handwriting, possibly in part to demonstrate their authenticity. Paul asked them to remember my chains or bonds, a reminder of his imprisonment and his need of their prayerful support uh, for him personally and for his ministry. Finally, he adds a blessing. Grace be with you. Amen. As he started the letter by asking that they might receive grace <coughs> from our Heavenly Father, so he concludes with the same blessing and prayer. The Colossians and we need many things, including the instructions and precious truths revealed in this letter. But our fundamental need is for grace from God, grace to cover our sin, grace to strengthen and sanctify us, grace to bring us to glory and the embodiment of grace is Christ. We need him. So in conclusion, from, uh, let us consider from this passage and indeed from this book, what which we've been studying for some time, some applications to our church. So a number of applications then uh, from this passage, some questions for us to consider. Firstly, <coughs> I wonder, do we have a high regard for all the servants of God, like the, the feelings and evaluations expressed by Paul concerning his fellow workers? Do we undertake tasks, however humble or arduous, that we might build up the Church of God by our service? Do we work with others to progress the gospel, or do we leave it all to the pastor, or just do our own thing? Are we open and honest with each other about our circumstances that we may have genuine fellowship and more informed prayer? Can we learn from Onesimus, who had been unreliable, irresponsible, and even running away from his responsibilities? Yet he became faithful and was prepared to return to his former pastor and the church. God can greatly use those who humbly repent, even if their past life has largely been wasted on themselves. Are we like Aristarchus, prepared to sacrifice our own comforts to give comfort and provide for those in real need, especially, I'm thinking of those who are suffering for their faith? Are we like Paul in relation to Mark, prepared to trust and co-labour with someone who previously disappointed us and let us down? Do we, like Epaphras, labour fervently and consistently for our fellow church members in prayer? Are we aware of the danger of slipping away from God's service like Demas because of love for this present world? And do we warn and humbly seek to help others who seem to be being drawn too much into the world and to its allurements? Are we prepared, like Nymphus, to use our homes for the work and people of God? Or is our home a castle to be kept in pristine condition for ourselves? Do we really believe in the ministry of the body, recognising and encouraging each member to develop and use their God-given gifts? Do we tell others why and how we value them? Or do we just complain and criticise? Do we realise our utter dependence upon the grace of God in our lives and that of our church? Well, we can't fairly uh, review the whole letter now, but do try to think about some of the highlights that we have covered. The church of every age faces dangers and fashions, but Christ is all sufficient. He is God, preeminent in all things, and we are complete in him. His blood on the cross bought our reconciliation to God. It is Christ in us that is our hope of glory. So we need to dwell on him and proclaim him. If we have been raised with Christ, then we need to seek those things that are above, not earthly things. We need to put off the old man with his sinful passions and desires and put on the new man and Christ-likeness, ruled by the peace, the spirit and word of God and worked out in all our relationships to show Christ to the world around us. <coughs> 
Well, may our God grant us grace to worship him with our lives and apply his word to ourselves, individually and corporately, fulfilling the ministries to which he has called us. Amen. Let us close with our final hymn, Facing a Task Unfinished. who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you complete in every good work to do his will, working in you what is well-pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory for ever and ever. Amen. <laughs>